All right, Jasmine, Stan, are you both ready? Yes. Yep. Perfect. All right. Um, for everybody who joined us, thank you so much for joining us today at Hatfield Marine Science Center's research sem uh, seminar. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffat, and I am the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, and I will be one of your hosts today. Um, Stan, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, my name's Stan Piotrowski. I'm a graduate student at Hatfield and a member of the HSO, the Hatfield Student Organization, and we invited uh, Jasmine to share with us today. And so Stan is also going to be co-hosting with me. Um, a few logistics before we get started. As most of you know, um, we are on a Zoom platform, but we ask that you keep your mics screen share um, and cameras turned off for the duration of this event. It just helps us when we have so many folks participating, um, really kind of focus in on what we've got going on. Um, we do ask that you participate and ask lots of questions. Um, just use the chat um, function. So if you scroll either to the top or bottom of your Zoom page, you will find a little call out box um, that says chat and you're welcome to put your questions in there. And Jasmine will be answering those throughout the um, presentation today. So go ahead and ask questions whenever they come up. Um, I also wanted to let folks know that we are recording this event today. And so if you are interested in watching it again, um, or if you wanna see any of our other past seminars, um, they are all posted on the link that I just put into the chat box. Um, so you're welcome to watch those. It takes me a couple days to get it up, but hopefully by Monday, Jasmine's presentation will be there and you can watch it again. Um, as always, if you're taking this for credit, uh, Michael Banks is also online and will be helping to navigate through any questions you might have for him. Um, but I just want to take a second here and uh, promote next week's seminar. So next week we have Bill Chadwick from Simmers at Oregon State University talking about when the axle seamount might erupt again. So um, if you want to find out a little bit more about his work, it'll be really exciting to learn more about um, what's been going on deep underwater. Uh, I also wanted to let folks know that we're gonna continue this virtual format for seminars uh, through winter term. So if you or anybody you're working with wants to present to the Hatfield community, um, we're starting to book dates now. So please feel free to reach out, contact me and we'll get things settled. Um, but I wanna hand it off to Stan for today's event. So Stan, would you like to introduce our speaker today? I would love to. Um... So Jasmine specializes in elasmobranch ecology and evolution. Her past research interests include small, um, small tooth sawfish movement ecology and hammerhead shark phylogeny. Jasmine completed internships with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, Fort Johnson Marine Lab, and FWC Division of Marine Fisheries Management. Jasmine worked as an instructor for the Saturday at Sea program through the Florida State University Office of STEM Teaching Activities and has a passion for science education and making science more accessible for everyone. She is the project coordinator for the Marsai Lace Project, which is focused on researching and promoting best practices to recruit, support, and retain minority students in marine science. In addition, she's the CEO of Minorities in Shark Sciences, an organization dedicated to supporting women of color in shark science. She's excited to help open doors for more underrepresented minority students to join the exciting field of marine science. And with that, um, I'll hand over the floor to Jasmine. Great, thank you. So I'm really excited to be here to talk to you all today. I'm going to talk about a couple of different aspects of my research. So as Stan mentioned, I'm an elasmobranch ecologist. Um, so I study sharks, skates, and rays. I'm interested in their ecology and evolution. And I'm also a big Harry Potter fan, so I've entitled this talk, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, Bizarre Chondrichthians. Um, so Chondrichthians, starting off, uh, we'll just explain what that is. Those are fishes that are made of cartilage, so their skeletal systems are cartilage. And um, so that includes sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras. Um, I don't actually study chimeras, although they are very cool. Um, so I study specifically elasmobranchs, which are sharks, skates, and rays. Uh, and they're called elasmobranchs because they have strapped gills. That's literally what elasmobranch translates to, the etymology of it. And uh, so that basically means they have multiple gill slits instead of just one uh, that bony fish and chimeras have. 
So that's kind of where we're starting off today. And just to give you a little bit more background about me, I graduated from the College of Charleston um, with a marine biology degree and a Spanish degree. And then I completed my master's degree at Florida State University. And I'm now working at Moat Marine Laboratory as the project coordinator for Marsi LACE, which stands for the Marine Science Laboratory Alliance Center of Excellence, which is a program funded by the National Science Foundation's Louis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. And we're basically just trying to research best practices to recruit, support, and retain minority students. I also run an organization called Minorities in Shark Sciences, which is similar in nature to Marsi Lace, except for that program is, that organization is specifically um, geared towards supporting women of color in shark sciences. So a little bit more specific than the Marsi Lace project. And I'll talk a little bit more about those towards the end if we have time, but I wanted to kick it off uh, talking about my favorite family of sharks, the hammerheads. So here we have a winghead shark, which is a species of hammerhead shark. And this project, I was looking at the evolution of this very unique family of sharks to understand how they got this head, why they have this head, what's going on with this weird head. And so I am going to dive in and tell you what I found and my research. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a spoiler. We still don't know the answer. We just have more questions. So at the end of this, you're not gonna get an answer and I'm sorry. Um, so we have 10 species of hammerheads. So a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, usually when I ask people, when I poll people at talks and things like that, most people think that there's somewhere between three and five species of hammerheads. There's actually 10. And uh, over here where I'm at on the East Coast, uh, we have the great hammerhead, scalloped hammerhead, smooth hammerhead, bonnet head, and a um, little further north on the East Coast, where I did my undergraduate work up in South Carolina, we have the Carolina hammerhead. And so there's a lot of different hammerhead species that we have here on the East Coast. Um, and they all are unique in the way that their head or cephalofoil is built, the way that it's structured. So here I have a uh, little diagram that shows you a couple of their different head structures. And so it's really interesting because even though they have these extended cephalofoils, they have these hammer heads and they all kind of look a little bit different. And so I was interested in understanding how this head evolved. So I was studying phylogeny, which is basically how the group that you're looking at is related to each other, how all of the different species are related to each other. So it's very similar to a family tree. So in order to understand phylogeny, so you have what's called the root, which is as far back as the common ancestor between all of the animals that you're looking at. And it goes to the present. So on the tips of the little field goals, are the species that exist today. So there are junctures where the species had a common ancestor. For example, in green here, we have a common ancestor between species B and species C. And then we have a common ancestor in yellow between all three, that would be the root of the tree. So whenever I talk about roots, that's what I mean. The common ancestor of all of the species that I'm studying. So the reason why I'm looking at this is because the evolution of hammerhead sharks has been up for debate for a while. So originally a hypothesis was put forth by Leonard Compagno in 1988, and that was done using traditional dissection methods and morphology. And so what he found was that the root of the hammerhead family, common ancestor likely had a small head similar to the bonnet heads where it's just a kind of little scoop 
um, of a cephalofoil. And then as you get closer uh, to the present day, the common ancestor of the wing head and the great hammerhead likely had a really long extended cephalofoil. So this suggests that the cephalofoil has been widening over time. So for a long time, we were operating under this assumption that this head has been slowly getting wider over time, which led scientists to ask really important questions such as why do they, why is this advantageous for them? What do they use it for? What niche do hammerheads serve by having this head that other sharks cannot? And so for a long time, that's how it was going. And then we developed molecular technology and the ability to look at DNA. And some other people came around and did DNA analyses of the hammerhead family and found something very different. So if you look at the tree on the bottom that was put forth by um, the Naylor lab, uh, which is the lab that I worked in as an undergrad in 2012, this molecular tree shows that the root or the common ancestor of all of the hammerheads more than likely had an extended head because the next closest living things to it are these sharks, the great hammerhead, the smooth hammerhead, and the wing head that all have these large wide heads. So that kind of shows the opposite that Originally, the root of this tree had a really wide head, and ever since then, the sharks have been evolving it away, which then leads us to assume that there's actually not a huge advantage to having this head. And in fact, there might be a slight disadvantage because they are evolving it away. So these are two very different ways to look at this family. Uh, based off of two very different methodologies. So I was hoping to reconcile these two methods by um, looking at non-cranial characteristics. So I wanted to see what happens if you ignore the head entirely. Let's just assume that the head is this weird thing that's happening and only look at the rest of the body so that the head isn't skewing this. If the head is doing something weird, let's not look at it at all. And I also was using a newer technology at the time, which was digital segmentation, which is where you CT scan specimens and you actually do kind of a virtual dissection, which allows you to look at structures in a way that you wouldn't be able to uh, in a more traditional dissection. So you can make really um, clear measurements and distinctions because you're doing it with a computer versus having the, the man-made you know, errors. And so this was what I was trying to do uh, to reassess the anatomical and morphological data that the hypothesis put forth by Leonard Compagno in 1988 used. And then I also wanted to reevaluate the molecular data so whenever the studies were done previously uh, to my study, they were all with nuclear DNA, which is DNA that comes from the nucleus, which is typically what we think of when we think of DNA. So when we think of the um, human genome project and things like that, they're looking at the nuclear DNA, which is extremely long, lots of base pairs. And so usually whenever people are doing these studies, short of spending all this time and money to get the whole nuclear DNA, they do uh, a process where they use libraries to collect important snippets of the DNA and they analyze that. So they look at, because a lot of the, the DNA is not actually doing things um, in terms of structures and evolution. It's more of like, I just need this, section of DNA to make basic proteins to survive. So they take the, the portions of the DNA uh, that are most telling of, uh, evolutionarily, and they just look at those. So instead, I was interested in looking at a different type of DNA, which is mitochondrial DNA, which is found in the mitochondria. And if you are an avid internet user, you probably know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. 
but it also has DNA in it, plot twist. So I took the DNA out of the mitochondria because it's only passed from mother, from the mother. And so you don't have this extra DNA coming from the father that's mixing and doing all sorts of things. It's very conserved. So it goes from a mother, passes to her offspring, and the, the next daughter in the line passes it to their offspring. And so it's much more conserved than the nuclear DNA uh, because there's not as much opportunity for it to change because it's not having that introduction of the foreign DNA coming from the father. It's also a lot shorter so you're actually able to take the entire mitochondrial genome um, out in a way that's a lot easier and less expensive than it is to do with the, to take the whole DNA from the nucleus. So I was looking at that and I wanted to see if maybe if I looked at a more conservative uh, genome, the mitochondrial genome, then maybe I would get a different answer than what people were seeing when they were looking at the nuclear DNA. So like I said, for the anatomical part, I did CT scanning. So this is a picture of a lemon shark getting CT scanned. This is the basic process that we use. We use the same CT scanner that is used in the hospitals on people. So this is actually a CT scanner at the Medical University of South Carolina. That's where all of my scans were made. And whenever we scan it, it looks a little bit like this. So it's kind of like a polar bear in a snowstorm situation going on. Uh, and then I have to go in and do a digital segmentation process uh, to be able to get it to look nice and clean like this. So we have the skin layer and then I have all of the structures that I've segmented out one by one in different layers to look at. So I can pull the structures apart. I can see how they fit together. I can make measurements on specific structures. I can ignore some structures, which in this case I was ignoring all of the cranial structures. And um, it's a really good way to do this because you can use museum specimens and you don't have to sacrifice animals to do it. And you scan the museum specimens and you're able to give them back to the museum. So it's a really sustainable way to look at an anatomy. So I want to really quickly show you uh, the process of how this works. So let me share my screen here on the video. So this is what it looks like as I'm actually segmenting. So this is a program uh, called Mimics. So on the left, um, and the top, hopefully it's also the left for you. It might be mirrored, I don't know. But uh, the three little boxes, that's the scan itself. And then the big box that's on the lower right corner, at least for me, is a 3D rendering of that CT scan. And so I'm actually working with the 3D rendering to separate out this very specific part of the shark. So I'll go through and I will remove everything that's not the structure that I'm looking at on that layer. And then once I have that separated out, I'll start a new layer and copy all of the structures over and repeat the process and remove everything except for a different structure so that I have a bunch of different layers that all have a single structure on them. So this process is actually, this video is actually real time. So this is actually how fast or slow I'm doing it, depending on what you think. Uh, but this is the speed that I'm doing it at. Typically, the sharks, um, it's the fastest I've ever been able to do a shark is probably about six hours. And the longest I've ever had to work on one was probably about 30. It depends on how bad the scan is. Sometimes the scans, it's really hard to tell the different structures and it takes me a little bit longer um, because they're a little bit more smushed together, either because of the way that the shark was sitting in the scanner or if it's really young, the cartilage isn't as dense and it's really hard for it to pick up. Um, so there's a variety of reasons. Sometimes the, the scan itself is just, you know, the it didn't hit it at the right angle or something like that. And sometimes it's so bad, I actually have to uh, rescan it. 
So that's kind of what the process looks like. And so let's talk about what I found. So I found a little bit different than what uh, Leonard Compagno found. They actually found two distinct groups within the hammerhead family. There was one group that had small heads and another group that had the wider heads. And it seems like still, um, so the Sphyrna tibero that we see here, that's the, um, the bonnet head with the little head and that's the uh, shark that's closest to the root of the tree. So it still seems to indicate that perhaps the small headed sharks evolved first. So that still is kind of true, but we have these two distinct groups, which is really interesting. Then we look at the molecular phylogeny and we still have these two groups where there's the small headed sharks and then the wide headed sharks, except for this time, it's the most, uh, the shark that's closest to the root of the tree is the Eastern Ablaki, which is the wing headed shark, which has the widest head of the hammerhead family. So still leads us to think that the opposite is being shown with the molecular um, data that the head was big and is getting smaller over time. So still no consensus, but I did a lot of filtering and I did, I looked at the unrooted trees and I realized that there's actually a really high agreement between the two unrooted trees. They're almost identical. So if you say, assume that you don't know where this tree starts, how are they related to each other? You get almost the same answer, whether you use the anatomical or the molecular data. So basically now the question is, where does the root go? And we're working on that now. Don't have an answer for you yet, like I warned you in the beginning, but hopefully soon we will. Uh, so we're doing a lot of mathematical modeling and trying to figure out how old the family is, uh, because one of the reasons why there's likely a rooting problem is because the family is really, really old and the next closest relative to it is so far away evolutionarily that we can't tell where the oldest goes. So that's the first step. We gotta figure out how old it is so that we can adjust our models whenever we're looking at the phylogeny. So hopefully in the next year or two, I'll have an answer for you all, but I don't yet. So be on the lookout for that publication. All right, so I wanna take a brief break uh, to answer some questions about the hammerhead stuff before I talk about sawfish. So if you have any hammerhead related questions, now is the time to ask. I'm not seeing anything in the chat at this moment, um, but we'll just give everybody a second. If you have anything that you wanna ask, um, put it in the chat and we'll get it forward. Um, I was just curious, Jasmine, is there other, um, uh, actually, let me ask the question that's coming up first. Do they have sensors? So Scott, can you expand that question a little bit for me? Scott is probably asking about the ampullae of Lorenzini, uh, which are sensory organs that are on sharks and rays. So sharks have them all along their snouts, for lack of a better word. Um, the hammerheads, one of the theories as to why the hammerheads have hammerheads is that actually has to do with the ampullae of Lorenzini. It's because they have a lot of them all along their cephalofoils. So it actually increases the surface area that they have these sensory organs. So one of the ideas is that they might have this head because it makes them extra sensitive. Um, to the electromagnetic forces because they have these ampullae spread out over a wider distance. Another theory is that it helps them see because it puts their eyes out really wide, which actually gives them 360 degree vision. Another theory is that they use them to uh, use the cephalofoil to kind of like turn faster, like having a giant rudder on your face. Uh, there are ideas about, well, maybe they use it to pin down stingrays, which one person saw a shark do one time and they wrote a paper about it. And that's the theory that exists now. Um, but they, they range in 
I would say likelihood of these theories. A lot of people have a lot of theories, but no one actually knows. So we're getting a ton of questions. So you're going to have to cut us off, but I'll start asking and then you'll have to help us out. Um, okay. So I had a question here about what modeling program you're using. For which part? For the phylogeny, it's PALP. For um, the segmenting, I was using MEMICS. Um, is, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> okay, Kristen, if that doesn't, then go ahead and let me know. Um, another one that's coming in is, can you tell us a little bit more about what you were hoping to learn by understanding whether the heads went from large to small or small to large? What is the bigger um, question, the purpose of the question? Yeah, so the big question is, basically we're trying to understand, so animals evolve to fulfill a specific niche. And when you have a group of animals that's so different from all of the other things related to it, it makes you ask the question, why? What are they doing that no, nothing else can do? And this is a really important question for hammerheads because a lot of them are vulnerable or endangered. And so if they have this head for a very specific reason and they're doing, they're doing something very specific in the ecosystem and we lose them, there are no other sharks with heads shaped like that. So it might mean that there are no other sharks that can do what they do. And so that's one of the really big overarching reasons why we study evolution, to understand adaptations and what animals are adapted to do so that we can understand what, what role they're playing in ecosystems and how the ecosystem uh, works together. So hopefully that answered your question. Are you willing to take one more before you move on? Sure. Okay, so why was mitochondrial DNA not used before in previous research? Is there downsides to mitochondrial DNA? So it wasn't, so two reasons. One, there wasn't technology to do it. Two, um, when there was technology, it was very expensive to do. And so in my lab, a postdoc in my lab that worked there before I got there, actually developed a method called mitogenome capture, which was much faster and less expensive to do. So it actually was within the range of possibilities for me to play around with uh, for this study. So yeah, before it didn't exist and then it existed and it was too expensive to do, but now it's cheap and a lot of people do it. Nice. Um, so do you want to move on and we'll get to any of these other questions um, at the end, or do you want me to keep asking your hammerhead related questions? Um, I will continue and we can loop back to some of these questions after I talk about my sawfish stuff. Perfect. Hang in there. If you asked a question, we'll try to get to them at the end. All right, take okay. it away, Jasmine. So now we're going to move into sawfish world. So we've talked about sharks. Now we're going to talk about rays. So the small tooth sawfish is the species that I was studying. So there are actually five species of sawfish around the world. Uh, all five species are endangered or critically endangered. This group, this family of rays is actually the most endangered family of elasmobranchs in the world. So they are really not doing great. And so that's one of the reasons why I was interested in studying them because I'm really interested in conservation and thinking about, like I said, with the hammerheads, these are really weird animals. So they're probably doing something very specific. You don't just evolve a saw on your face for no reason. So um, I'm very interested in conserving species like this because they are so unique, which means they probably serve a really unique purpose in the ecosystem that we just don't understand yet. So some really fast facts about the small tooth sawfish. They're born live between 70 and 80 centimeters. Uh, they grow to about five meters or 16 feet in length. So they get to be quite large. Uh, they're actually not the largest of the, small of the sawfish family. They're actually sawfish that get even larger that grow up to 24 or 25 feet. Um, they are called sawfish because of their tooth rostrum or saw. Um, which is, looks like a saw and someone said that's a sawfish. And I, like I mentioned, they are born live, but uh, they have a saw on their face. So that 
is concerning, but they have this gelatinous sheath over their rostral teeth when they're born, which you can see in this picture here. And that protects the mother during the birthing process. And so this is just one of those examples of evolution finding a way. And so evolution was like, all right, this is bad. Mother's giving birth to chainsaws doesn't end well. So there's an adaptation to protect the mother, which is, I think, super cool. So like I mentioned, the small tooth sawfish is critically endangered. Uh, so it was listed on the Endangered Species Act in the United States in 2003, which basically means that we have to protect it federally. What are we protecting it from? So major threats include bycatch and fisheries. So bycatch, for those of you that don't know, is when a fishery is targeting a, a group of fish or animals and they catch something else. So that's something else that they catch, which isn't actually what they're targeting is called bycatch. And so even though no one is actually fishing um, commercially for sawfish, they are getting caught in commercial fisheries accidentally. And the scary thing about this is we don't actually know how many are being caught. We only have observer coverage in about 1% of shrimping vessels, um, less than 2% in long line uh, vessels. So observer coverage basically means that there's someone on the boat collecting data on everything that that boat catches. So we only know about 1% of all of the ships that are out there fishing for shrimp. And so we only have estimates of well, how many sawfish we think are getting caught. And um, that estimate is about 80 um, in shrimp and about 31 in the shark bottom long line fishery. And that's a lot of sawfish considering they're critically endangered. And so that's concerning. They also have uh, issues with loss of critical nursery grounds. So mangrove shorelines are really important to them uh, when they're small juveniles. And due to climate change and also the development of shorelines, particularly here in Florida, they're losing their main uh, nursery habitats. And then of course we have issues with poaching and illegal trade where people will catch the sawfish and they will cut off the saw for decorations um, and they'll throw the animal back and it cannot survive without its saw. It needs that to hunt. Uh, so the saw has, like I mentioned, those sensory organs all along the bottom of it. And so they use that to detect their prey and then they also will swim into schools of fish, thrash around with that saw to impale them and injure them, and then swim back through and swallow whole all of the stunned fish. So it's really important to their hunting. And so when they don't have that, they basically starve. And so it's, it's a really big problem. Like I mentioned, bycatch and fisheries is a really big issue for uh, these animals. So as part of the sawfish recovery plan, the recovery team who I work very closely with had to decide how big of a threat these different commercial fisheries are and what is the potential for us to restore uh, the population just by changing a couple of regulations about how this fishing is done. And the highest threat was the shrimp fishery. Um, it's basically, uh, a death sentence for a sawfish to get caught in a shrimp trawl. They're dragged on average for four hours. That's a lot of weight and pressure on a very sensitive fish um, to be dragged like that. And so a lot of times their saws will break off. They'll have a lot of internal damage. Uh, and so the mortality rate for the sawfish is very high, which is why this threat is really big. They also are caught the most in shrimp trawls. So it's really just a huge recipe for disaster. And then there's the gill net, um, which is also a high mortality rate, but in Florida, um, gill netting was banned in state waters in 1995. It's still legal in federal waters and sawfish don't know where the state boundary is. So they obviously swim off into federal waters and they're at risk there, but that risk has been um, pretty much eliminated in state waters in Florida. 
And then the bottom long line is a medium risk because although they do catch a fair number of sawfish, it actually is a very survivable event for the sawfish, particularly if the fishermen are using the hooks that they're supposed to and they aren't soaking their lines more than they're supposed to, sawfish actually swim away quite all right from long lines. That's actually how we catch our sawfish. We catch our sawfish on a long line because it's not very stressful for them. So that's what I was interested in looking at for part of this project was understanding where the riskiest spots are for sawfish so that we can start to make policies to regulate where fishing happens to mitigate some of this bycatch risk that the um, sawfish are dealing with. Another part of my project it has to do with the concept of critical habitats. So critical habitat is a legal term that is that are areas with physical and or biological features essential to the conservation of a species that's been listed on the Endangered Species Act. And so every time a species is listed on the Endangered Species Act, the very first step is to find and designate their critical habitats. And that has really uh, clear implications legally of what can happen in those areas. It is basically designated to ensure that no one messes with those areas because they are really important to an endangered species. Critical habitat for small juvenile small tooth sawfish has already been designated. As you can see, these um, candy cane striped spots, those are the areas for the small juveniles. But the recovery team, when they were designating critical habitat, decided that the small juveniles behaved significantly differently from the large juveniles and adults. And so they actually uh, separated them out. So the small juveniles don't move very much. They stay in their nursery in these estuaries. And then they get to be about two meters in length and then they swim off somewhere else uh, that up until my research, people really didn't know where they swam. Um, they had guesses, but no one really looked at it. And so they designated this small juvenile critical habitat and then decided that they were going to go back in later once they had some more information about how the large juveniles were moving to designate the uh, large juvenile and adult critical habitat. So part of my project is understanding how large juveniles and adults move so that the recovery team can look into those areas and find critical habitat for the large juveniles and adults. So I want to really quickly show you just a really fun video of sawfish birth because it's just cool and who doesn't want to see a sawfish birth and this seems like a time to show that so I'm going to show it. So this is um, our team and um, we they just caught a sawfish um, and so this is a female sawfish like I said we catch them with the long lines that's Dean my advisor that I worked with so you can see we flipped this sawfish over and there's just like baby sawfish rostrum sticking out of the cloaca what's up with that and so uh, we had to decide or Dean had to decide should we try and take them out or should we leave them? And ultimately he made the decision that he was worried about them hurting the, the mother by kind of being stuck in the canal, the birth canal. And so he made the decision to pull them out since they were already partially coming out. And so they were able to tag uh, these little sawfish and measure them and everything and release them. And so this is some really cool data we got. No one has ever uh, recorded a sawfish birth before. Uh, we were able to tag three of these little sawfish, take blood from them in addition to the mother to measure their stress levels. Uh, so the mother was only slightly more stressed than normal and the babies weren't hardly stressed at all. So that was really exciting. And so then they were released and they swam off all nice and shiny and healthy. And um, so that was a really exciting experience for everyone on that trip. Okay, so let me 
go back here to my slideshow. Now that we've had our fun little tangent. Um, so I want to talk about tagging. So as I said, I was interested in the sawfish that were greater than two meters in length. Um, my tagging areas were the Florida Keys, uh, the uh, Everglades National Park, which I don't know if you can actually see my mouse, but it's over here. Um, Everglades National Park is this area right here. And then we also had collaborators that were tagging in Charlotte Harbor, which is around here. Uh, and then we had two sawfish that were opportunistically tagged um, near Indian River Lagoon uh, over here. And um, they were caught in an intake canal for a power plant and someone called and we were able to tag it. So that was cool. Uh, so we, aside from those two, uh, they were all caught with long line, hook and line, or a drum line, which is basically just a single line that you put in the water with bait. And um, when we caught them, we took measurements, we counted their, their rostral teeth because not all small tooth sawfish have the same number of teeth. Uh, so it's actually a range, which is really interesting, which is something that you can use to kind of identify them a little bit. Um, and they also have different numbers of teeth on either side. So their left and right side might be different. So it's not always the same amount of teeth on each side, which is cool. Uh, so we do that. We take photos of the rostrum to use for photo identification. Um, and then we tag them. And there were two types of tags that I used for my study. I used acoustic tags, which go internally, uh, which there's a little surgery where we make a small incision um, and put the transmitter inside of them and suture them up. And so that transmitter is just with them for the rest of their lives. And it has a 10 year battery, so we can track them for 10 years. Uh, or we use the satellite tags, which are attached to them externally on their dorsal fin. And those tags will pop off after their designated uh, amount of time, which usually we um, code them to pop off between 60 and 150 days, depending on the tag. So those are the two types of tags that I was using. And uh, this is what they look like. So in the top uh, left there, we have the acoustic tag. Uh, so that's life size. So it's only about this big and it goes inside of them. And the benefit to this tag is you can get really fine scale data. And the way that this tag works is it constantly pings um, every X number of seconds, depending on what we code it for. And it will ping. And when it's near a receiver, which you see here on the bottom right, the receiver will hear it and record and say, oh, this transmitter was here at this time on this day and it'll keep recording until that transmitter is far enough away that it can't hear it. And we go down and we download these receivers. So dive down, pull them up out of the water, uh, connect them via Bluetooth to a computer, download all the data off of them, clean them off because there's always a lot of biofouling and then um, put them back down. And um, so that's how we get the data from them. The detection, Coverage depends a lot on how many receivers you have and their arrangement. Uh, the downside to this acoustic telemetry is that you only know where a sawfish is if it's near a receiver. If it swims away from your receiver, you have no idea where it went. So that's why I also was using the satellite telemetry. So these are pop-off archive, pop archival tags. So they will be on the animal their designated amount of time and they estimate their position based on depth and temperature and light and they are constantly estimating their position so they it's not uh, limited to receivers or anything like that it's constantly doing it and then it'll pop off it'll float to the surface it'll deliver that da data to a satellite which we can then pull down um, on the computer and so this is really great because you can track it continuously no matter where it goes. It, it's not um, limited to where receivers are or anything like that. 
But the downside to it is that it is estimating its position. And so that can have a lot of uncertainty asso associated with it. And so it's not very accurate, but it gets the job done for the large scale. So by combining these two methods, I was hoping to get a really clear picture of what was happening by getting the fine scale from the acoustic and the large scale from the satellite data. So when I looked at bycatch risk, I was interested in looking at where is the fishing happening? So using the observer data, I um, looked at how many hours were spent fishing in different locations and created heat maps that showed where fishing was most likely to occur for each of these three fisheries throughout the year. And then I did the same thing with sawfish where I looked at the amount of time that sawfish were in an area and use that to calculate the probability that a sawfish is in that area. So in blue, you see areas that are, there's a high probability that there's a sawfish during that point in that area. And then the yellow is the um, fishing uh, effort for longline, pink is for gillnet, and then the purple is for shrimp. So you can kind of see how some of this overlaps where there's a lot of uh, potential for a sawfish to be there and there's a lot of potential for fishing to be happening at the same place. So then I took this probability, multiplied that, you have the probability of a sawfish being there and the probability of fishing happening in that area, multiply those together and you get the probability of interaction. And so I did this for the three different fisheries and uh, these are some of the maps that I made. So for instance, in January, you can see that there's really high pressure by the Marquesas um, for the shrimp fishery. So that's something that's really interesting. But then you look at July, it's really low. You look at August, it's really low. Um, and so what this tells us is there are very specific areas in very specific times of year where the fishery bycatch risk is high, which is good news for us because that means there's a potential for um, a time area closure, which is basically where you close down a certain area at a certain time to fishing uh, to protect species. And this is really good because that means that the impacts that you have economically on the fishers that are doing this fishing is decreased. So instead of just blanketly closing an area for the whole year, you can say it's only going to be closed for this small amount of time. And that can have really big impacts on uh, the bycatch of sawfish. Okay, so I also was looking at their space use, like I said, trying to figure out how the sawfish are moving these large juvenile and adults. Um, and basically what I found is that the sawfish are in the keys during the winter. And then there's a group of individuals that migrate uh, north in late spring around May. And then they come back down in fall around November. And this is really interesting because only some of the sawfish do this. There are sawfish that just stay in the Keys year round. And then there are sawfish that make this migration. And it has nothing to do apparently with the sex of the sawfish because males and females are making this migration and males and females are staying in the Keys. It doesn't seem to have a lot to do with the length of the sawfish, um, the sawfish tagged in Charlotte Harbor, the ones that moved were larger, uh, but I think that's just the difference between uh, like two meters and 200 or 2.15 meters. Uh, so some sawfish, they take a little longer to develop that uh, behavior of moving offshore. And so I think that that two uh, to 2.15 meter range that the um, Charlotte Harbor sawfish were was just like that critical time where some of the sawfish are um, ready to move offshore and then some of them are a little late bloomers. 
um, cause I didn't see that pattern with sawfish tagged in any of the other locations. So I was also interested in where were they moving when they were doing this migration. So I had all, I broke all of the receivers down into these regions to see how they moved and how they used these different areas of Florida. And I did a network analysis. Um, so let me just briefly walk through what this network is. So the little circles are nodes. Those are the regions that I just showed you on the last slide. The lines connecting them are edges. So that shows the movement of a sawfish from one node to another. And the weight of this line shows you how many movements there are relative to all of the other connections. So a really thick line shows you that sawfish move between those two points a lot uh, in comparison to the thin lines. So I made networks for different seasons. I made networks for comparing, well, what do the mature sawfish do versus the immature? What do the males do versus the females? And then I was also looking at some specific metrics for the networks to understand how these regions were important. And so one of them was degree, which is how many um, nodes are connected to that node, which basically shows you that um, it's really important to the network and that sawfish travel through there no matter where they're coming from or going to. And then another important one is betweenness, which is the number of paths that go through a node. So if every time a sawfish wants to move from node one to node four, they go through node two, it's going to have a really high betweenness which means that that is probably a place that the sawfish stop for whatever reason, whether it's to hunt or rest or whatever they're doing um, before they continue on their journey. So this is an example of one of the networks I built. This is every sawfish. Uh, so you'll notice that some of the lines, the edges go through the state of Florida the sawfish are not walking. That just means that they managed to get all the way to the other side of Florida without crossing any other region, which means that they probably went offshore where I couldn't detect them on the receivers anymore. So um, this is kind of what it would look like. And what I found is that the movements are non-random. So this is a directed mi migration that happens where they're all going up both coasts. Um, and they have a very specific trajectory that they're moving towards, which is north. Um, some potentially important regions are the Florida Keys, offshore of Cape Canaveral, the mouth of Charlotte Harbor, and Everglades National Park. Um, the areas with high betweenness are the Florida Keys, the area off of Cape Canaveral, the mouth of Charlotte Harbor, and the Tampa Bay region, which is where I'm at right now. Um, and so these are areas that they tend to stop at on their way um, to migrate wherever they're going. So some of them migrate farther north than others, um, but this seems to be a good, these seem to be go-to places for them on this migration. So this kind of adds some extra questions. So the sawfish move up both coasts. And what I'm interested in understanding is why some sawfish move up the east coast of Florida and some sawfish move up the Gulf Coast of Florida. Um, one of my working theories is that it's based on the nursery that they were born in. So the Gulf Coast, the um, sawfish moving up the Gulf Coast are moving that way because they were born in the Charlotte Harbor nursery, which is on the Gulf side. Um, and this is a trend. Uh, but isn't true for every, every sawfish because some sawfish use both coasts. One year they went up the East Coast, one year they went up the Gulf Coast. And there was one sawfish that started going up the East Coast, decided it didn't want to do that, turned around and went up the Gulf Coast. There's weird things happening. So I'm really interested in investigating that. I'm also interested in investigating why some sawfish stay and others leave. Um, and so these are the next questions that I am going to be addressing. And so be on the lookout for that um, publication to come out. And uh, that is all I have to say about the sawfish. 
And at this time, I will break for five to six minutes of questions. <laughs> Thank you so very much. So questions are already coming in. Um, one is just to back up a little bit and tell us a little bit about the sexual maturity and longevity of the sawfish. So sawfish, like a lot of elasmobranchs, take a really long time uh, to mature. And so they, we don't know how old they live to be. Uh, we have some sawfish in captivity that live to be 60. It's in SeaWorld and that was in captivity, but who knows what happens in the wild. Um, as far as maturity, um, so it's going to take them, uh, depending on some sawfish grow a little bit faster than others, it's a size thing, not necessarily an age thing, um, but it's about 10 years on average um, for them to start maturing. Um, so somewhere between 10 and 13 uh, is when the females will do their first uh, pupping. And um, the males mature a little bit slower than that. And um, it's a really slow process. So you'll start, uh, in terms of the hormones, the females will start producing the hormones um, probably about one or two um, seasons in advance of when they're actually able to mate. Uh, and then the males, similarly, their claspers, uh, which is their reproductive structure, uh, starts to harden um, and about a year after it kind of starts that process is when they start mating. Thank you. Um, so we have a question here about um, based on the ampules of Lorenzini that you already talked about in the rostrums, is that true for the sawfish as well? And could you use something like that to help them um, create some kind of pulse or wavelengths that would deter them from approaching the fishing nets to reduce bycatch? Um, yeah, so they, they do have that in their saws. Um, that would be an interesting question to look at. They've tried that with sharks with deterrence on long lines and it doesn't seem to work all that well. So I don't know that it would work on the sawfish either, but I don't know if anyone has tried, maybe. Thank you. Um, and another question is, have the movements of other species of sawfish other, where, in the, other places in the world been studied? And do they have similar migration patterns that you're, that you're seeing in Florida? Um, short answer to that is yes. Um, not to the extent that I have with the small tooth sawfish. Um, but the large tooth sawfish, they have done some movement studies, um, but they don't move as much as the sawfish, as my sawfish did. Um, so they didn't really have a really strong migration like these sawfish had, but also the study, the range that they could track them was small. So they very well could have been traveling and they just couldn't, um, they didn't have receivers spaced enough out to pick that up. Great. Um, Stan, are you still on the line? Do you want to jump back in? I know you had a couple questions from the students themselves. Um, yeah, I guess um, it was a it was a wonderful presentation. I, I know I learned a lot. Um, but could you talk to us, I guess, about some of your work with kind of minorities in science? Sure. Um, okay, so the Minorities in Shark Sciences is an organization. Um, that I founded with three other shark scientists in June. And um, we basically are a group that's dedicated to supporting women of color in shark science and uh, eliminating barriers that have historically kept women and people, people of color and other marginalized communities out of science. And um, so one of those is just, you know, creating an atmosphere of inclusion uh, and so we created a community uh, where people could come and um, get mentoring and network, which is, uh, has been shown to be harder for um, people of color. Uh, people of color aren't usually as successful at getting mentors, um, mostly because mentors tend to gravitate towards people like them. And currently in science, we don't have a lot of people of color. So if everyone gravitates towards people like them, no one gravitates towards people of color. 
And so we're just trying to kind of help people network and form a support community. We also are interested in eliminating the financial barriers um, that make shark science and marine science in general really hard to get into um, because you're required almost to do these experiences that are unpaid or you have to pay the people to go volunteer with them. Um, and so we have interns, we offer internships with um, Bimini Shark Lab and Ocean, Oceans Research in South Africa um, that are no cost internships. Uh, we're currently raising money to be able to provide a stipend as well. Um, so not only does it not cost anything, but you make some money doing it because you're doing a job. Um, and we work with K through 12 outreach. Um, we're raising money as well to have a camp for middle and high schoolers to learn about shark science. Um, that would be for un, um, students from underserved communities um, in central Florida to bring them out to the coast to experience the ocean. Uh, we also have partnerships with SeaQuest, uh, which are a series of aquariums throughout the United States. They have eight different locations. Um, and we're working with them to do an after-school program with them as well. So those are the, some, of the, some of the things that we're up to right now. And I have on this slide our website and Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for including those. All right. So for those folks that asked questions that we were unable to answer, uh, Jasmine, is it okay if they reach out to you specifically um, using sure. your email contact if they want to follow up? Yes, my email is there. I'm also active on Twitter. Uh, I do a lot of science communication on Twitter. So feel free to tweet a question at me or DM me. Um, I'll answer either way. Um, and yeah, my email is there as well. Feel free to use that um, to shoot me your questions. Perfect. Thank you very much for joining us. That was a deeply rich conversation, which is why there's so many questions we were unable to answer. Um, you went into a lot of really interesting work that you're working on. Um, it, some of the questions that we were unable to get to was just kind of um, relating some of your work to the work that's been done in, um, in our area. So I'll let those folks reach out to you specifically. Um, but for everybody online, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you spending the uh, Thursday afternoon. Well, for you, Jasmine, Thursday the evening um, with us. Uh, appreciate it. I hope you join us next week, same place, same time. Um, you're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat and amazing presentation and wonderful work um, coming in. So you're hearing applause even though you can't hear it. So it's definitely coming in. So thank you very, very much. And to everybody else, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. Stan, any last words? Uh, no, I don't think so. I just really appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak with us, Jasmine. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jasmine. Thanks Dan. Thanks Cinnamon. Bye everyone. <laughs>